Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Film Club Podcast, where every month we deep dive into a different aspect of cinema, directors, actors, genres, or franchises. It doesn't matter, because it's always fun at the Film Club. I'm Dean. I'm Boo. And this month, we're talking about David Lynch. And this week, we're talking about... Wild at Heart. That's right. Wild at Heart, 1990 film, winner of the Palme d'Or at Cannes, and stars Nicolas Cage and Laura Dern... It's directed Willem by Dafoe. Willem Dafoe's in this. There's a lot of people in this. There is a lot of people in this. A lot of Twin Peaks regulars reappear in this. And this was before Twin Peaks? No, this is... I, I guess we can get into this. This is a weird one in the Lynch catalog. Because it's based on a book, which mm. usually his movies are kind of his own scripts. Yeah. Or if they're based on something, they're kind of like studio deals he has to make. That was Dune, basically. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was made basically between season one of two of Twin Peaks. Okay. That's why like the first half of uh, season two of Twin Peaks is really soap opera-y mm-hmm. and not nearly as surreal or weird as season one because he was off making Wild at Heart and Mark Frost had to basically be the showrunner for the first half of season two. Gotcha. Um, but yeah, so Wild at Heart's made in between there, but because how that works, this comes out in 1990. And I think season two started in like 1991. 91 and then Twin Peaks premiered in 90. Yeah, or it premiered at like the end of 89 and then ran through 90. Hmm. It's it's something like that. But yeah, this comes out in between season one and two of Twin Peaks, which is, you know, the Lynch masterpiece opus work. Uh, but yeah, this movie is fucking weird. Very weird. Um, we watched this movie together. Was this your first time watching it, or have you seen it before? I'd seen it once before this, and because I'm, you know, a director completionist, mm-hmm. so if I find a director I like, I try and watch their whole filmography because I'm a crazy person. I mean, you couldn't do that with Kubrick. It took the podcast finally getting you to finish the catalog. Well, that was mostly because I I always wanted there to be one more Kubrick film because mm-hmm. like I Kubrick's my favorite director. I never wanted to complete that mm-hmm. filmography, and then I was like. Dean, it's it's time. It's time to like finish the work. But with David Lynch, it's like really easy. He has ten movies and a pretty healthy amount of shorts. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I watched this movie once to say I had like completed the filmography, and I remembered very little about it except for man, Nick Cage and Laura Dern kill it in this movie, and Willem Dafoe is the creepiest human being in cinema. And he's only in the movie for like fucking 15 minutes. Yeah. And then you still watched it twice on the same day that we watched it together. I did. I did. Because the first time I watched it, I came away with, man, this movie's like really good for a Lynch movie. And it's like uh, really, you know, weird and interesting. And then when we watched it again, I'm like, I don't know if I like this movie. I don't, Which is shocking. I Yeah. I don't know if I liked it. I didn't know if it was good. And then I watched it again after, like, you, like, went home, went to bed, all Mm -hmm. that stuff. And I'm watching it again, and I'm like, I still can't really make heads or tails of it. That's the same camp that I'm in right now. Yeah, because this was your first, right? This is my first time. I mean, I love Nick Cage, love Laura Dern, love Willem Dafoe. But, yeah, I was just kind of like, I don't know how I feel. I mean, there's some David Lynch movies where I've been like, okay, what the fuck? And I've been what the fuck the entire time. But that was uh, Blue Velvet for you? That was Blue Velvet for me. But this one, it was just kind of like, I don't know. I'm a little a little on the fence. And I'm not really getting pushed, you know, either side of the fence. I'm just there. Yeah, because it has a real plot that you can follow. Like, yeah. there's a real structure and narrative going on. It's not like Eraserhead where it's very surreal and kind of weird. No, it's very realistic and modern. So it's like you understand what's happening. And then the weird surreal shit happens Mm -hmm. where the good witch of the West shows up. Yeah. And then there's a weird thing where sometimes like there's this weird hitman group that's for some reason just has naked women wandering around and it's never really referenced again. And like. But it's like I could totally understand that 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 kind of clientele would be at that kind of motel. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of weird Wizard of Oz stuff going on. It's And it's like, and I understand because you know. I, you know, you talk about David Lynch a lot. I've done research on him before and it's like, I understand that that's his favorite film. But it's just kind of, when it's sprinkled in the movie, it's like, 
you're not giving me anything to be like, oh, that's why he's making Wizard of Oz references. It's just, it pops up randomly. There's the Good Witch or there's the Wicked Witch of the West. And it's like, okay. And, you know, she's clicking her heels. It's like, maybe if we had seen her like reading the book or, you know, they gave the book to the little boy, then it's like, Maybe oh, there's okay. more like allegory to it where yeah. he's trying to make his own version of Wizard mm-hmm. of Oz and this highway is there you know their yellow brick their road. yellow brick road but it's not that's not really what the movie's going for there's no like tin man there's mm-hmm. no like cowardly lion or anything it's just kind of i mean you know if if we really want a deep dive you know his mom or not his mom her mom could possibly be the the tin man no heart she's like um, the wicked witch i thought because like the end of the movie where she throws the water on the picture that, that's true i mean um the boyfriend of the mom or you know whatever he is uh harry dean stanton's character johnny i think he's a pi in the movie it's like you know is he the cowardly lion because she tells him something and he stops or is he one of her flying monkeys that she's just you know go do this go do that for me do my bidding for me yeah and it's a thing where it's like we're trying to like pin the wizard of oz stuff to more concrete thing mm-hmm. in the movie where you know okay this he might just be winging it honestly <laughs> this I, I know i've defended david lynch saying that no there's a lot more intent to this than people give him credit for but you know sometimes i'm gonna just call it out when i see it i think this was a he read the book wild at heart that was like mm-hmm. this is based on and just kind of free associated like this story with Wizard of Oz and just kind of threw it in the script. I can see that you too. Because the writer or the the original novelist was like, I kind of like this. You know, no, it was good. I really liked the movie. That half of this shit I didn't I didn't see in my book. But hey, David Lynch is a good director. Yeah. So that's like I, the vibe I kind of get from it. Where okay, I can kind of see what he's getting at here, but I don't I don't know what the point of it all is. I think that's my my issue. Like Blue Velvet, I felt had a point. Mahal and Drive, I felt had a point. Mm-hmm. Um, Elephant Elef- Man, Elephant Man, I felt had a point. This one, I don't know the point he's driving at. I don't, I don't know what the theme is here. But maybe we can, maybe we can parse that out. But um, or are we just all wild at heart and weird all over? Oh Lord. <laughs> okay. So, um, is there anything else you wanted to like? Give give to the preamble here before we start breaking down the no, plot. No, no, no. I, I think I'm ready to jump in. You think you're ready to jump into this wild road? Because this movie starts wild. Also, you're not getting the jacket. Oh, come, you mean the snakeskin jacket that represents my individuality and my desire of personal freedom? The- yeah, I don't think you could. Uh, I don't think you could rock that. I I love the fact that that is an iconic thing of the Nick Cage canon is him in that snakeskin jacket because the you know why that's in the movie right no because Nick Cage insisted that wasn't in the script that wasn't a David Lynch weird you know oh Again, let's not put surprised. It in the movie Nick Cage was like my character is gonna really want to wear a snakeskin's jacket and then they just put it in the fucking movie but we'll get into it we'll get into it. Because the movie starts, and it starts like it's Terminator 2, with flames and explosions over a black background as the titles go on. Also, your sound bar is very good. I'm surprised the neighbors didn't come over and be like, are you guys okay? Oh, <laughs> oh God, yes. This movie has a dynamic range that is that would make Christopher Nolan blush. Like, the, the dialogue is real quiet, real nice, everyone's having a good, wholesome time, and then it explodes! Mm. And it's just loud, banging thrash metal, like gunfire, and mm. it, it, it it's in between the same scenes yeah. sometimes. And it's like... I was pl- I was I was hot I was Johnny on the spot with the uh, with the remote control trying to like even this out so I didn't blow an eardrum. I mean, Randy had to leave the house just because the movie was so loud. It was obnoxiously loud at some points. I'm not gonna lie, but like I I give credit where it's due. I think that's intentional. Yeah. I just I just don't appreciate it. <laughs> oh no, because it's like you know oh, we're having a quiet conversation and then you know dun 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 dun. dun, dun, dun. Oh yeah, and it does, and it's not even a thing where it's just like, oh, it's like the the score comes in and it ramps up to like it just smash cuts in to Dave Mustaine just shredding on a fucking guitar, like it's legit thrash metal. It's fucking and it's wild. always the same part. Oh yeah, same part of the song. Hey, you know that's just uh, that's their favorite part. But 
that's how it opens. That's like the first thing you see in this movie. And then we go in to see like this nice swinging southern cotillion ball. Where you got the jazz music going on. Everyone's in their Sunday best. Oh yeah, you got like Glenn Miller or um, Benny Goodman playing in the background. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? You know, it's fire and metal and this. And now, you know, we're going back to the 40s. Like, okay, this is different. That Yes. And that's a weird thing about the movie is that we're bouncing between this modernistic, like 1990s, like youth in rebellion mm-hmm. with, you know, this thrash metal, like this punk punk rock kind of aesthetic like laura dern's uh character lula when we see her like in her normal attire or peanut or yes peanut is wearing like the skin tight black leather like biker chick get up mm-hmm. and like you know nick cage's sailor is you know snakeskin jacket like rebel type you're drawing parallels from like the 90s like counterculture ish mm-hmm. in this 1940s ho dunk like it was Presley and, you know, oh, love me tender kind of like vibe, mm-hmm. which I don't know why he's drawing this parallel, but I can kind of read it. Like, kind of. I, kind of. It's like rock music. Like that's points of like counterculture and they just kind of Evolution of rock. Maybe. But again, we cut into the swing and party and then, you know, Lula and Sailor, you know, Nick Cage, Laura Dern are heading out and they're going to go on to the town when who do they get stopped by a hitman who's come to kill sailor and then what happens he gets fucked up yeah yeah this hit like like sailor nick cage just kind of drops all pleasant and just beats this guy to death in like a jarring in violent way like more like way more violent than like uh a mission impossible movie or any like mo- mainstream action oh, blockbuster. Yeah, it, it's just you know fists hands the wall you know basically beats the the back of his head in yeah like we see brains in this and i mean i think the major faux pas was that the the hitman wore a baby blue suit and he did he also mouthed off and you know insulted lula and that's sailor don't stand for that you don't talk to Peanut that way. Don't talk to Peanut that way. And, like, that's how the movie starts. Like, we're, what, ten minutes into the movie, and we have a violent murder, mm-hmm. and, like, it's set up by Lula's mother, Marietta. Like, that's, like, the implication mm-hmm. we get. Uh, or it's not even an implication. The hitman straight up tells him, like, Lou, or, like Marietta, tell me to fucking murder you, and this is the money she paid me, and this is the knife I'm going to use it with. And then, you know. Yeah, you were banging her mom in the bathroom. I was uh, just like, oh, okay. Yeah, like, there's, like, a big plot dump in the beginning. Sailor and Marietta are at odds over Lula, her hard control, whatever. And then, you know, obviously Nick Cage goes to prison, and he looks, you know, beautiful in prison oh yes you know they he hit the makeup chair before they sent him uh, up the river but he goes for uh, i have it here because it it notes it in the movie uh 22 months and 18 days later Mm -hmm. a sailor gets out nick cage gets out and he falls right back into lula's arms and well yeah she's there to pick him up exactly in this nice cadillac where i don't know where the fuck she got it and gives him his snakeskin jacket and they're all happy they're gonna Go hit the town, but before that, they're gonna. Yeah, a lot of banging in this There's movie. There's a lot of fucking in this movie. We're, that should be a blanket thing. This is a hard R movie. Yeah. Uh, but they're going out to go have their fun time, and this is where we see Lula's mother step forward as like the antagonist, because mm-hmm. she is uh, going to hire a hitman to kill Sailor so that she can keep Lula for reasons. Yeah. And, like, we we get flashbacks of, like, why Marietta hates Sailor, but it's, like, vaguely clear. Yeah, I mean, it's nothing concrete. Like, you know, oh, he did this to her. Oh, he, you know, he stole. Like, no. Like, like it's vaguely related that, like, he may be a witness to the murder of Marietta's husband that she might have been involved with. But that's not even, like... Concrete. Concrete. Like, Sailor's, like... Yeah, I was, like, there, but I sat in the fucking car. Like, I just saw the house go up in flames. I don't know what the fuck happened. Yeah. Like, that's, yeah, basically it. But Sailor and Lula, they, they go out dancing to mm-hmm. some nice thrash metal. Yeah. You know, at the clubs. And then Sailor, you know, starts, you know, defending his woman from one of those dirty punks at the at the bar. And then after he's done, he starts crooning. 
starts singing to Lula. The crowd goes wild. <sighs> what what song is he singing? Because it's some like love me tender or love me thing. Fucking it's some Elvis song. I know that. Well, I know he sings Love Me Tender at the end. Yes. I don't I don't remember at the bar if he sings Love Me Tender. It's it's something, but He could have. Yeah, but Nick Cage, he's uh he's got a singing voice on him. He does. I mean, you know, I won't knock that. You know, his voice is actually good. It's just kind of like okay, he's slowly turning into the king. All right. I love how the the thrash metal band just kind of knows exactly the song they're supposed to go into. Well, yeah. I mean, it took them years to practice and become, you know, the thrash metal band that they were. So you do start with some Elvis work and then, you know, you work your way up to, you know, Sex Pistols. The the evolution of a guitarist. Exactly. Evolution of rock and roll. That That's your thing. That's the theme of the movie. It's the evolution of music and rock. Just saying. I took history of rock and roll as a class in college, and it was awesome. So maybe that's the vibe that David Lynch is going for. It could be. There, there's. This is a pretty solid soundtrack. I mean, all it, things considered. It is. I mean, um, one of the songs in it, I can't think of the name of it, but it's from, uh, it's in Friends, the TV show. And I was just like, oh my God, I'm like, I love this song, and it works for this scene so well. It is a thing. Like, don't get me wrong. The movie's weird gonna, as shit. I'm going to have to look up the soundtrack now because it's going to bother me. But go ahead. Yeah, yeah. The movie's weird as shit. But there is a thing where it's like, like this scene in particular, where like Nick Cage, he's singing to Laura Dern. And it's like this very, it's all shot really like dreamy. Mm-hmm. And like, don't get me wrong. Up to this point, the movie for the most part is grounded in some sense of reality. This is the first time we go full bore like, yeah, this none of this is real. Like this is full surrealist because the lights change in the club. The band just starts playing this like crooning mm-hmm. thing. You hear the like the club thrash metal people start screaming and yelling like they're at an Elvis concert in the fifties. And it's it's like really like it's really weird. I think it's shot beautifully though. Yeah. And I kind of get what he's going for, where it's like, oh, you know, he loves her so much that they're the only two people that that matter in this whole crazy world. And when he sings to her, oh, the world stops for him. I kind of get that. Yeah. It still comes out of fucking nowhere. Oh, yeah. But I mean, that's a David Lynch movie. Sometimes shit just comes out of nowhere. A lot of the times. I Maybe, but I felt, I feel like his other movies there's there's a build up to the weird shit like at least for like twin peaks right yeah like for twin peaks like the the world that that uh show inhabits it lends itself to okay everyone's a little bit quirky and weird and then when you see like the weird surreal dream shit happens it's like no this was kind of like led up and built up to this kind of crazy dream shit but then you have fire walk with me that kind of feels like Wild at Heart, where it's just, we're going 100 miles per hour. What the fuck is going to happen? Yeah, okay. If we're getting to Fire Walk with me, that's a whole other, like... That's a beast. Yeah, that's a whole other can of worms. Because, like, whereas Wild at Heart is, like, a self-contained thing where, for the most part, it's pretty coherent. For the most part, everything, just, it works like a normal, like, narrative movie that has some, like, ups and downs, good scenes, bad scenes. But it, like, work. It functions as a movie. Fire Walk With Me is almost a non-functional entity in and of itself, but it is a it is the perfect cipher for the three seasons of Twin Peaks, mm-hmm. and it also works as a very, very dark, kind of tragic um, character study of Laura Palmer. Yeah. And for that, it's great, because Cheryl Lee, I think, is a fucking phenomenal actress. Oh, she is. But it's also alien, too, because, you know, we're dealing with different worlds, the Lodge. It's just like, it, there, there is so much going on. It's not just this one reality that we're dealing with. Yeah. And with Wild at Heart, it's like, it just kind of switches. Like, it, mm-hmm. it's like, this is the setup of the reality we are in, where there are criminals, there are hitmen. It's a very, like grounded sense of reality and then we get to full like surrealism in certain moments that are a little too jarring Mm -hmm. because i mean like you know we watched um elephant man to start off the month and that one's just straight like oh yeah there's what three moments in the whole movie that are like weird surrealist stuff and it's like the The beginning, beginning the end and the one dream sequence yeah but even then those felt like okay thematically they make sense Mm -hmm. 
and like even narratively the dream one makes sense and like i i get that and then you know when we did like blue velvet it's like okay this is a world and it's building and things are drawing out and like then dennis hopper shows up and it's like what the (sighs) fuck is this guy on he's from a different movie but that movie is like a hardy boy you know like hardy boys goes dark you know oh the underbelly of the world you know dark noir um of you know americana that one works that movie's like pretty a straightforward kind of flick this is just weird (laughs) but i digress because you know that big scene you know going on yada 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 um Sailor and Luna, they decide they're going to hit the road and they're going to head west and Sailor's going to break his parole because, you know, a girl like Luna, she doesn't want to rot away over here in South Carolina. She needs to hit the big city of California. So they go into California. Yeah. And this is when Marietta is like, you know what? Fuck it. Let's get the hitmen on them and send them on, you know, track him down because she is i don't know what marietta's deal is is she like a queen pin of some sort of crime thing she's a dog with a bone yeah she just can't get a sailor out of her mind she wants him gone Mm -hmm. and she's gonna do whatever it takes to get rid of him and it's not even you know i gotta protect my daughter i'm doing this you know for the safety of my daughter it's just i've got this beef with him and i won't be content until he's gone yeah well i i get that i get her motivations I get her motivations. What I'm talking about is what does she do? Why is she this connected? Like, is she like a crime boss person? Cause she like is dating, um, Johnny who's like Harry Dean Sands character, the yeah, PI, the PI, but like, apparently she's also like, Oh, well I know Stanton. He's a hitman, and he's got all this blah, blah. And Johnny also knows about him. And I'm like, is she like, like a like a crime boss or is she like connected to the mob well, like, she doesn't give me crime boss kind of vibes it's just i think she's just there she just knows happens to know people i mean she gives like she calls the hitman guy and then he proceeds to call like his boss mm-hmm. who's just chilling on the toilet taking a dump watching this naked woman dance in his bathroom while he drinks tea and I want you to know, everyone, I'm not making up any of that. You can you can find the scene. He is sitting on his toilet, on yeah. the phone, taking a dump, and about three feet away is a, you know a, a lovely topless woman, just kind of vibing, kind of vibing, you know, dancing to no music in the bathroom. Yeah, with him. Very much a David Lynch movie. It's, okay, I you you throw that out a lot, where it's like ah, it doesn't need to make sense. It's a David Lynch movie, but I need to know. Do you think it is pointless to be in here, or do you think he he? There's a reason why it's there. You know, I I know that you love to soul search his movies, but we had a guest on that said, you know what? I watched interviews of him, and he says sometimes I just put the stuff in there to put stuff in there. I I I, I did see that interview. Yes. So it's like you know a lot of it. It's kind of hard to really digest and want to dissect it because it feels like. Oh, that might be fin- might be funny. Let's toss it in. Let's see what people have to think about it when they see it. Do you do you think it he is um do you think it's absurdist comedy more than it is thoughtful like symbolism? Yes. Cuz this movie has been qualified as a dark comedy. Yeah. Uh like a dark comedy romance film road movie. I mean, spoiler, Willem Dafoe shoots his head off in the, you know, during the bank heist. In a very cartoony way. And, and cartoony way. Yeah. It's like a Ren and Stimpy bit. Yeah. But like, you would think that, would you say that this movie is a straight, like it's straight up just a comedy? Like, a, I don't like think, a lot of it is more of a comedy than it's anything else? I think it's like a dark comedy where it's just, you know, yeah, you know, we've got some dramatic themes, but it's like, I think the underlying is humor Mm -hmm. because i mean there's a lot of funny bits in the movie that's true i feel that's like david lynch inserts a lot of like comedic moments in like a lot of his movies i mean look at the uh the play-doh broken nose at the end of the movie oh god that thing is massive for a broken nose that is probably on purpose for Mm -hmm. being in there i mean like even in his other movies we've um we've talked about like in blue velvet you know dennis hopper is like 
Pabst Blue Ribbon, man. No Heineken, man. Like, that's just, like, he's just doing shtick. Yeah. Like, he's doing shtick for half of his stuff. And I'm like, okay, there's, like, comedy here. Don't get me wrong. I'm super uncomfortable because Dennis Hopper's a crazy person. But, yeah, like, and, and I mean, in this movie, um, you know, David Lynch kind of let Nick Cage be Nick Cage because there were so many rewrites. And he was just like, yeah, you know, go off the cuff, you know, figure it out. So it's like, I think it was just kind of one of those things where it's like, yeah, we were have like we have an idea of what we're trying to film, but if you say something, that might be better than what we have written down. Or if you act out something in a different way, that might be better than what we have scheduled. I wonder if that's why so many actors like going back to to work with David Lynch. Because they get to explore the characters that they have within them and just, you know, let's see if this works. It's it is really interesting cuz like a lot of i guess a lot of people wouldn't think of david lynch as like an actor's director Mm -hmm. you know because they're like oh well all of his movies had these deep surrealist you know ideas and he must be so exacting trying to get his what is in his head on the screen Mm -hmm. but from every interview i've ever seen of actors who worked with him are like no super sweet guy kind of lets you do whatever you want like he knows what he's looking for but he gives you a lot of leeway to search your character and figure out what you want to do And, like, that seems, like, right up Nick Cage's alley. Mm -hmm. Nick Cage seems like an actor who wants a lot of freedom when he's working on a film. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, like, I think that's the reason why he usually doesn't work with the same directors more than once. Because he's, like, you know, I want to explore because, you know, acting is a craft for him and he wants to, like, expand his work, so. Yeah, Yeah, it's like Johnny Depp, you know, Johnny Depp isn't Johnny Depp when he's in a movie. He becomes these characters. And I feel like Nick Cage is the same way where it's just with this movie, it's like, oh yeah, go ahead, take it, run with it. If you want to be Elvis, be Elvis. And we switch back and forth between him being Elvis and him being, you know, I'll fight everybody for my woman. That's an interesting parallel of the Nick Cage, Johnny Depp. Because I mean, like, Johnny Depp, I think, is, like, a really... Johnny Depp is a much better actor than I think people gave him credit for for a long time. Mm -hmm. And I think around... I think it was around Pirates of the Caribbean where he broke out as, like, you know, Jack Sparrow. And people were like, oh, no, this guy is, like, not just, you know, oh, Dead Man or um, 90s Johnny Depp where Mm -hmm. he just did kind of whatever. Yeah. He was like, oh, no, he's a blockbuster star. Once they started trying to push Johnny Depp as A-list blockbuster, like, star power, I think that's, I think that's when he, I don't know, started phoning it in. Or maybe, like, I think his quality of performance went down. Yeah, I think it's more when, you know, the the studios try to, like, you know, you're great, you're a moneymaker, go make us money. But then you have directors like Tim Burton, and that's why he goes back to Tim Burton so much, because he's embraced it be whoever you want to be and let's see you know what we get on the film and it's like that's why directors like david lynch tim burton are so important because they encourage their actors to do whatever and it's like yeah they birth some of the greatest performances yeah i mean like johnny depp and ed wood is probably like what was in his top five greatest performances i think so yeah i mean it's it's also a thing where it's like man like it's it's also the sad fact where it's like i think tim burton's career starts like really declining in the 2000s like in terms of quality and it's like you know and david lynch he just stopped making like feature films after um inland empire so that's like a whole other can of worms but it is interesting that like in this movie like it feels like the actors are given so much room to work with especially like um the actress playing marietta uh she's laura dern's like real life mom yeah, so diane ladd diane ladd thank you yeah yeah because yeah diane and we, ladd and we were and... trying to figure that out a few weeks ago and we couldn't figure out what her name was which and is we... weird because she's like a famous actress she is but we were being so stubborn that we wouldn't even look it up we were just like it's gonna come to us when we least expect it and then yeah it took today for us to be like oh, that's her yeah, name of course that's her name <laughs> but yeah because like she is going wild when she's in her when she's at the house and she's on the phone and she starts playing with the lipstick and she does the full like (laughs) red mask of (laughs) lipstick on her face like okay she has like an uncomfortable descent into madness yeah and there's some shit that she's doing where i'm like that had to have come from like some 
deep place that she was working with. That couldn't have been like in a script anywhere. Or we have Grace Sabrinsky, who plays Juana, and Isabella Rossellini, who plays Perdita. And it's just their scenes are just like, well, what's going on here? Yes, yes. It feels like there's like a whole background thing that like it feels like they wrote a long character history that is just not referenced on screen but you feel that there is something going on behind behind those eyes yeah it's like something's happening and it's like you know their tie into the story is that perdita is with uh bobby who's played by willem dafoe so it's like okay so it's like you're tied to the universe in this way through bobby but it's like you know it's like they're hypnotizing the men to you know I'm not going to repeat the phrase, but, you know, to bang, bang, bang. Yes. And the guy's just, you know, in the trance, like, okay. And it's just like, what is going on? Are are they hypnotists, but then they're bank robbers, or at least uh, Bobby is? It's like, I have no idea. Yeah, it's it's a thing where it gets into... It gets into really weird sections, because, like, I don't, I don't know what this script l- would have looked like. Well, I mean, there was a lot of rewrites, so who knows how fat that script was by the time they finished filming. Yeah, or how fat it was when it started and how much got cut out and it's trimmed. Just, you know, pulling out pages. Okay, never mind, we're not going to do this route. Yeah, because it feels like there's so much that people are... It, it feels like a lot of these characters feel very fleshed out, and then, like, a lot of the teeth is just missing. Mm-hmm. And that, granted, that feels like a lot of what happens with a lot of david lynch movies where it's like man there's like a lot here but like a lot of this was probably cut for time or just like practicality reasons which is why like twin peaks the return is so like insane because it's 17 hours long of just uncut weird david lynch material yeah yeah i I stick by season one's the best season i i have a lot of love for season two i i know it's the thing where it's like the james stuff i know is like really bad and it has no <laughs> relevance but god damn it i love a good soap and opera just you and i is your favorite song oh uh, <laughs> it's so good oh god but, but just saying you know. season one has james you know looking at a who's the best friend again um hmm? laura's best friend oh laura's best friend uh, donna donna when he's looking at Donna and it looks like his head's going to explode. <laughs> it's the it's so good. Honestly, everyone should just watch Twin Peaks, but do it. We're watching Wild at Heart. We are. And uh so they are heading heading west and they end up in uh, New Orleans. And you know, they're in New Orleans, they're having a grand old time. The criminals are closing in on them, but as they're like laying in bed, you know, after having, you know, another like 5 minute long like fucking sex montage, uh, you know, you know, Sandler and Luna are talking, and Luna tells us about her cousin Dale, and we get a cameo oh, yeah. from Crispin Glover. Yep. And th- again, the the movie has a pretty repetitive structure. Mm-hmm. Um, Sailor Luna, they go to a town, they bang, they get up to some shenanigans, and then they tell a story, or there's a flashback. Yeah. Uh, we've seen Lula, like I guess she was assaulted when she was younger. Mm-hmm. We see that. Sailor uh, saw Marietta or Lula's father, you know, catch fire. Marietta, the thing, like we go, we get a lot of flashbacks. Mm-hmm. This is just a non sequitur that Lula decides. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell Sailor this right after we've, you know, just just finished up. Why not? Why not? <laughs> My um, crazy ass cousin that dresses up like Santa. Her crazy ass cousin Dale, who dresses up like Santa Claus, and. He is he likes making sandwiches at all hours of the day. Yeah. And one time his his mother found roaches in his mm-hmm. underpants and she says she walked in on Dale putting a cockroach on his anus. <laughs> yeah. His anus. And yeah, then, that happened in this movie. <laughs> and then we cut to one of the funniest sight gags in any David Lynch movie, and maybe any movie. Of after she says she found a cockroach and she walked in and it was on his anus and it's then it's Crispin Glover standing and standing in a full like three piece suit in front of a house, and he just kind of shifts a little bit and then lifts his leg up real high and takes a long side step over and does like the electric slide real slow and you can and you know like there's a cockroach in his pants and you just get all ooky but you can't stop laughing and you're like. Why is this in this movie? Why is Crispin Glover in this movie? Also, Crispin Glover's in this movie. 
I think by that point, I, already, I had already thrown my hands in the air. I'm like, you know what? I'm not even going to question anything. Is this, is this where you just like checked out completely? I, I think so. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because, I mean, you know, if we're going to make anus jokes, I mean, I think the best one's still Donnie Darko. He told me to shove that book up my anus. You love Donnie Darko. I am, and I'm wearing my Donnie Darko shirt today. Oh, yes, your spooky skeleton shirt. Yes, I am. Yeah, that... It it is it is again the top three anus anus references in the in the movies we've watched, uh, but I'm just saying, like it is such a weird non sequitur that I, like I know a lot of people say that like oh David Lynch a lot of it is um like off the cuff like free association this is like he makes movies, basically how people, jot down notes in a notebook yeah. Like, it's just, like, it's all a lot of, like, vague, random, disproportionate ideas that he's able to blend together, put on screen, and have it all function as a singular work. Mm -hmm. I don't know how this relates to the rest of the movie at all. I mean, I feel like this is probably, like, a story he heard, like, in a bar once, and he was like, that's funny, I'm gonna save that for later and use it in one of my feature films. Maybe, because it is funny. Like it is funny. It's really weird and in in a little creepy. Like that. Like the first part starts like a fucking horror movie. Oh, because yeah, we see him getting dropped off in the Santa suit, and it, I mean, it's a dirty Santa suit. I mean, he looks like a serial killer. Yes, he looks like a serial killer, and that he thinks aliens are in aliens and the black gloves are coming to like ruin holiday spirit, and that's forgot, why he dressed up as Santa. I forgot about the black gloves, and when he has, what is it like? The rulers surrounding the black gloves. He has rulers in in like measuring tapes surrounding a pair of black gloves that he is and he is lying on the floor in his tidy whities, like poking at it with a fucking yardstick. And you're like You were in Back to the Future. You were, yeah. Like what the grand I know Crispin Glover is like a weird dude like outside of like back to the future like he makes like weird fucking movies you birthed marty mcfly now you're doing this he was in friday the 13th for god's sake he was but like it is like i understand he's a weird dude but this is just weird very weird it's funny though but um so we get that non sequitur and then sailor and lula they're they're hitting the road again and uh, as they're going, we, you know, this is when we actually learn that Sailor was the driver when um, mm-hmm. her Lula's dad died and all that stuff. And that's kind of how they met. Uh, but this is also when Marietta heads on down to New Orleans herself. And she gets, you know, she picks up with a hitman and they're now they're on their trail and they're going to like track him down. Yeah. And then they basically leave the movie for <laughs> the rest of the runtime. Yeah. I think they just disappear. Yeah. Or, or they're on the road. That's why we don't see him. Exactly. I mean, because there is like this thing where it's like the hitmen kill Johnny Marietta's like boyfriend, other henchman yeah. person. He dies. We get like a little scene of that, but then they are like non entities for the rest of the movie. Right? Like, I'm not, I'm not messing yeah, here. Yeah, because we have to focus on um, Willem Dafoe because Willem Dafoe ultimately leads Sailor into getting back in the big house again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cause they're on their, yeah. Cause they're leaving new Orleans. They're heading West. Uh, they're, they, they're headed to Texas. They're heading to Texas. And this is where, uh, they arrive at big tuna, Texas, like on the way there, there's like a car crash that also is kind of a non sequitur, but it has uh, the twin peaks actress in there. In Laura de- Flynn Boyle. No, it's a uh, Sherilyn Flynn. Uh, oh, Cheryl know, Flynn. Yeah. Cheryl Flynn. Yeah. Sherilyn Flynn. Sherilyn. Sh- Sherilyn Fenn. Sherilyn Fenn. Sorry. We are so sorry. You're one of my favorite people from Twin Peaks because you do the Audrey dance. She is Audrey Horn, and she's great in the show. I mean, the Audrey, the, show. the Audrey dance is so iconic. We try to incorporate it into our everyday lives. But um, yeah, I wanted to. I just wanted to bring this up because this is another instance where I know why David Lynch has put this in the movie, mm-hmm. and it is one of those things where he just dropped in because he wanted to do it, and not because it relates to the movie so much. Mm-hmm. Uh, because when he met um, Sherilyn Fenn, mm-hmm. um, he described her, her look, her... Like a porcelain doll. Like a porcelain doll. And he had this, like, idea or image of, like, oh, a broken porcelain doll. Mm-hmm. And when he was making this movie, because this was, like, right in between Twin Peaks, so he had her number or whatever. Yeah. And it was like, 
had her come in for like the day for this scene just so he can get the image of her as a broken porcelain doll Mm -hmm. on screen and like like work that idea out Mm -hmm. so it's her she's in this car crash she's like bleeding and she's like running around trying to like reason what's going on and then she just kind of dies on the side of the road yeah and it, it, is never referenced again it's almost like a toy running it down on its battery yeah where it's just kind of you know going around in circles repeating the same phrases because she's just you know my mom's gonna kill me i you know i i lost one of my pins that has you know uh pearls in it or where's whatever. my purse where's my purse i need to fix this and it's just so bizarre but it's also you know kind of fascinating because it's like that's how the brain works sometimes it just you know you can't rationalize what's going on so it's like it's like you're on manual yeah or you're not you're on automatic and it's just you know you're just doing these things and lula's like you know we gotta help her she's dying and then she collapses and you know she's coughing up blood because obviously she has you know internal injuries and then she just dies yeah yeah and it's and it's a thing where it's like i I wonder, that's probably like the whole Dale thing they were, you know, where it's like, oh, the cousin and all Mm -hmm. that stuff. It's like these disproportionate ideas that David Lynch has. And Mm -hmm. this is, again, the only reason I bring it up is because I know the origin of it. Yeah. And it's like, he has this idea. He wants to get this image, this this thing out of his head and on the screen. Mm -hmm. And he just puts it in the movie. Yeah. And it's like, okay, I understand where that came from. Mm Mm-hmm. I understand that, like, again, it's like a writer's notebook. That's how he makes movies. He just kind of throws it all in there and tries to work it out. But it's like, it's how much of this movie is that? Because I feel it's probably a lot of it. Yeah. Because from what I got is, like, from the book, because I I didn't read the book. I know vaguely what it's, how it works, but I read through, like, interviews and stuff. Mm -hmm. That much of this movie, Wild at Heart, just uses the premise line Mm -hmm. and some of the crime elements. Like, oh, there's, like, a Hitman thing and Marietta and, like, that. Like, that's vaguely, like, what he took from it. Yeah, it's just an outline. Yeah. It's an outline and we're using the title. Pretty much. And then, like, he added all the Wizard of Oz stuff, all this car crash stuff, all the Mm non-sequitur stuff. Like, he adds that on top of it, on top of this outline, this premise. Mm -hmm. And it's, like, I I guess it works. I mean, it's it's more interesting than compelling mm-hmm. just to see this like this guy's brain kind of work out these images and like push them out there. Yeah. But we're we're gonna get into some really weird fucking shit in a minute. But before we do that, this is the scene that I had wanted to talk about when we were talking about the movie soundtrack. Yes. So my friend's reference that I was making earlier, it's a song called Wicked Game by Chris Isaac. And it's used throughout Friends. It's more kind of like Ross and Rachel's like love theme. Mm-hmm. And after, you know, years of seeing it at Friends, like, you know, oh, I love that song. And yeah, that makes sense. But seeing it for these two characters and them, you know, driving through the desert alone at night and it's just playing over and over on the, the tape cassette. I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I, I kind of feel like that's more a sailor and a, a Luna or a Lula kind of song. It, just, it feels right for the it, it movie. It feels raw. It just feels like, you know, there's so much emotion and so much depth to it. That's that's kind of how those char- the characters are, right? Mm-hmm. They're very, like, raw, like, passionate people mm-hmm. to each other. They're re- you really do feel like they're, like, deeply, like, in love with each other. And, you know, the song's very melancholy, and that's kind of their relationship. You know, they've lost almost three years together. Mm-hmm. Mm, spoiler they're gonna lose even more years together yeah but it's just kind of like this romeo and juliet relationship where they're just trying to be they're getting pulled apart when they just want to be together yeah and they're they're on this like long run across america Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like you know consequences of my own actions like oh you know i I, we're running across america now everyone's after us and now we're kind of like trying to still be this like rebellious couple in love spontaneous spontaneous couple in love but then you know these actions are going to come to roost and that that's what happens when they get to um when they get to texas it's like you know all you had to do is wait for your parole to finish then you could have taken her to california exactly but you know they get to texas they arrive at big tuna texas that's that's the town they run into and once they get there this is the consequences coming to roost you know with all the banging we've seen guess who's pregnant yeah, little peanut's gonna have another peanut. Yep, Lula is now very pregnant. Yeah, and this is you know, 
a, a pinch in the thing because they were going to go to California. But now they're like, well, we got to stay here because you're no in con- you're in no condition to drive because she's like sick and thrown mm-hmm. up and all this yeah. other stuff. So they're staying at Big Tuna, and this is where they meet um, Willem Dafoe. Yeah. Bobby Peru. Bobby Peru. Spelled like the country. And he is this, like, mysterious drifter-type character. We later learn that he's, like, in cahoots with, like, the hitmen or whatever. Yeah. He was basically sent out here to cut off Lula and Sailor mm-hmm. before they can get to California. And Bobby has this wonderful idea. Of setting up Sailor in a robbery mm-hmm. and killing him during the robbery. So, like, you know, hey, he died in a, in a holdup. Life happens. It, he's a bad guy. See? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then it could be like, he died in a holdup. And then, like, Lula could be like, oh, well, he was never any good. And then all this mm-hmm. other stuff. Right. But before he actually gets Sailor to go with him to the robbery, because he, he convinces Sailor, like, hey... You're going to have a kid on the way, you know, because Lula's in the family way. Mm-hmm. So you should come and help me do this do this stuff. And, you know, Sailor's like, yeah, I'll go do it. But before they head out, uh, we get probably the most intense scene of the entire movie with uh, Bobby Peru and Lula in the hotel. Yeah. It is really intense, really uncomfortable. Very uncomfortable. Incredibly well acted. Uh, and... Uh, yeah, how do you want to approach this one? Um, is it's assault, right? Yeah, it, it's assault. Uh, that turns into a punchline gag at the end. Yeah, and results into Willem Dafoe really peeing into a toilet. Yeah, that was a prop toilet. That, that was a prop toilet. No one told him about. No, and then he felt super bad for the person that had to clean that up for him. So there's a lot going on in this scene. Let let's let's break this one down because this is like probably one of the top three scenes of this movie like just like on a pure like acting level um but sailor's outside working on the car lula's inside the hotel like by her lonesome and she's just like oh hanging out right yeah bobby comes in and he's like hey lula i'm looking for sailor where is he and she's like oh well he's outside oh, okay well can i use your you know toilet before i go yeah i gotta pee and she's like oh cool sure so Lil Defoe goes pees in the toilet for real because he's a method actor He's a goddamn thespian. Not- or they just, you know, plied him with a bunch of water bottles and nowhere to go. I'm going with thespian. Uh, so he pisses in the toilet. This is a set. That's not a real toilet. So he just kind of pissed in a hole in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then as he's going to leave, you know, he's like, Lula, you look like a bunny. Like a sexy bunny. And then he like kind of grabs at her. And yeah. Lula is like really like leave me alone, and then he says I'll leave if you tell me if you say you know fuck me, and then he just repeats fuck me fuck me fuck me over and yeah. over again, and it gets softer and softer, and they get closer and closer, and it's like he starts rubbing her hand his hands all over her all, all over Laura Dern, and you're like this is so uncomfortable. I've s- you're you're just waiting for a sailor to pop into the room and kill him exactly or are we gonna get like is he gonna like full-on assault her like what's going on and then yeah because we've had the flashbacks for lula where she was sexually assaulted by her dad's business partner yeah yeah her uncle something or other Uh, uncle pooch yeah uncle pooch which and then totally unrelated he died in a fiery car crash a week later but I, i like the you know we get the bits and pieces of that story and then we see it come to full fruition when her mom comes home and her mom beats the crap out of Uncle Pooch. And yeah. then, you know, we see, you know, yeah, just, you know, it happened one day. He just died in a fiery car accident. I'm like, as it should have. Of course. But he's doing this. And I I think she finally just, because he says, you know, I'll let you go if you just say mm-hmm. it. And I think she finally, like, just barely audibly says it. Yeah. And then he just, like, lets her go, takes two steps back and says, well, sorry, honey, I would, but I got to go. And he just... Kind of. And he just mm-hmm. fucking leaves. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah, because he's a, a gross character. He is. Also, props to Wilma Dafoe for being able to speak as well with the giant prosthetic mouth thing yeah. he has going on. Because it makes his gums like twice as long and makes his teeth all like mm-hmm. gangly and shit. It's, it's pretty gross. But I mean, Willem Dafoe is such a great actor that he will do whatever and whatever prosthetic, whatever situation and put on a great performance. Oh, yeah. Willem Dafoe is, like, an 
S tier like actor. Yeah. Like I've not seen a Willem Dafoe performance where I wasn't just compelled. Mm-hmm. Like we've we've seen him before in uh, Boondock Saints. Um, I've seen him in The Lighthouse a bunch of times. I love The Lighthouse and him and uh, Robert Pattinson in there. Green Goblin. Of course, his his finest work as any thespian was Green Goblin and Spider Man. I mean, he made a lot of great speeches. Yes, lots of great speeches. But after that again. It's just a weird scene because it happens and is never brought up again. She, we never see her telling Sailor. Mm-hmm. We just jump into the heist. Yeah. And it's like there's a vague idea that that's like a thematic arc. Where it's like, oh, it happened to her as a child. Now it's happened to her as an adult. Mm-hmm. She's a victim. And, and, and you know, hurts. it's happening again. And she's so traumatized that she can't fight. She, inst- you think, you know, is she going to be fight or flight? And it's kind of, you know. She's doing flight because she's so terrified and she's just stuck in that moment. Yeah. And it's, I wonder if that's a thing where, oh, you know, her arc eventually is she's going to like grow up and be more assertive or mm-hmm. like take charge of her own life. And this scene might be on that like arc. Oh, it happened to her as a child. It's happening to her now. And then the next time we see her, she'll be able to fight back from mm-hmm. this after this development. Yeah. But it's just like, fuck, I get, it's so uncomfortable. It is so uncomfortable watching this. It's a great scene, but it's, it's an uncomfortable it's, it's scene. It's very uncomfortable, and then it's just onto the heist, and like you said, we never approach it again. Yeah, I mean, the heist is uh, is again where we go into slapstick comedy again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we we have a dog that walks off with the guy's hand. And yeah. yeah, so um, the heist is at a train yard is what it looks like it, that's what it looked like yeah it looks like an old west bank well it's texas so yeah, you know but they go and they walk in they rob the place or whatever they're wearing these pantyhose masks yeah that really isn't changing their their faces at all i mean you know if you paid nicholas cage for this face you're gonna have him you know cover it up come on now but they're doing the whole robbery and then as they're about to leave then Bobby Peru mm-hmm. basically like unloads both barrels into the um, the tellers, the tellers, and Sailor's like, "What? Oh my God! I can't believe you're doing this!" And then he tries to shoot Bobby Peru, but those are dummies, mm-hmm. dummy, because you know the guns fill with dummy bullets or blanks or blanks. You know, it's it's just funny. And then like there's an intense stare down between the two of them, and we get the close up of Willem Dafoe's face where it's like obscured in that pantyhose and it's so fucking creepy. And you're thinking, Sailor, you got blanks in the gun. Why not just throw the gun at his head? I mean, Bob Cruz got a shotgun. So, you know. Or, you know, maybe pull off the pantyhose from your head uh, because you know the police are outside and just throw yourself outside and, oh my God. He doesn't know the cops are outside. That's something that, that happens after they run out. Because uh, there was, like, oh, God, um, Isabella Rossellini's character. Uh, her name was Perdita. Perdita. So she's, like, outside because she's the getaway driver. And as soon as they go in, that's when just the cop rolls up and just starts, like, talking to her. Like, you know, what are you doing here? And she's, like, waiting for what? For my friends to come out. What are they getting? Feed. She's just, like, yeah. very much um, not making herself... Um, inconspicuous Mm -hmm. but finally you know they like sailor runs out of the out of the bank or whatever she peels the fuck off because she's like fuck this shit and then the cop and bobby peru have a good old-fashioned shootout well that's after perdita uh knocks over the cop with the car i it that one almost looked accidental it i kind of laughed because the cop looked like he was in pain yeah because she hits him in the the hip yeah, it looked like it, it looks like she was supposed to just like pull out and like pulled out and actually like hit him with like the headlight of the car because mm-hmm. it looked like he just was standing too close. Yeah, it, but yeah, it that one I I e- probably have to that, watch it again to see if it was like an actual like stunt or if that was like either like that's really great accident. acting or that was a screw up and he didn't get hurt that bad. But it was just kind of like ah, I got hit by a car. Right. But um, they have the shootout Mm -hmm. and the cop unloads like the entire mag inside Mm -hmm. of Bobby Peru and Bobby Peru like falls over and uh, blows his head off with his shotgun. (laughs) Accidentally 
lands on his shotgun and blows his head clean off. Like like an onion in a bag. He just <laughs> goes flying into the air like, just, like what? And it's and it's like really graphic and but then you're like, oh my god, this is such violence. And then you see the the two tellers inside that had just been shot and one was like Where's my hand? Oh, I don't know. But if we find it, they can reattach it. It'll only take about an hour. And then we cut to a dog running away with the guy's hand in his mouth. Like we're in the Looney Tunes. And then you got Sailor who has just seen Bobby blow his head off. And he's like, God damn it, Bobby. God damn it, Bobby. And then, you know, Sailor's like, well, shit, I guess I'm going to jail. Back to the big house. And he goes to jail for six long years. And then... When he comes back out, Lula has now abandoned Marietta. She has taken charge of her life and tells Marietta if she's going to get in the way with her and Sailor again, she will kill her. And Marietta finally has a full-blown breakdown and melts because she's the evil witch. Yeah, her her picture melts in the frame. That is, again... The free association of Wizard of Oz. Lula throws a picture, throws a, a glass of water at a picture of Marietta on like the nightstand or, coffee, or table. coffee table or whatever, and we see it dissolve and poof away, just like the Wicked Witch from Wizard of Oz, like the exact same fucking effect. And I'm like, okay, this is weird, but you know, it's gonna get weirder. So Lula goes, picks up Sailor from the jail with their with their son. And it's like, this is your son. And he's like, oh, man, I guess I'm going to be a daddy now. And as they're going away. He doesn't even hug him, just shakes his hand. Shakes his hand <laughs> like men, damn it. And as they're going away, Sailor is now unsure if he could be a good husband and father. And he runs off, which is weird because that's never established as being a crisis for his character. Yeah. I mean, we never see him stray from from Lula. It's always, you know, it's us against the world. Uh, No matter how much time they throw me in jail, I'll be back to you. And now it's like reality is setting in. And it's like, you know, before we were wild at heart. Now we have a child. I need to behave. And he can't, like, come to terms with that. And Mm -hmm. then he, like, runs off and he gets confronted by some, like, street youths. And It's uh, always the youths. The youths. That just keep showing up from, you know different buildings and under the bridge and like they come out like the fucking jets in west in west side story yeah yeah and they they go up and they you know beat up sailor and then sailor has a vision a vision of cheryl lee dressed as the good witch yeah because i mean you're david lynch this is 1990 you gotta bring the whole cast of twin peaks back why is she the good witch of the west i don't think it's of the west she's just the good witch Okay, why is she the good witch? Because she's floating. Like, she has the orb of light, and she's in the she's, pink gown. She's in the pink gown, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think it was like, damn, Laura Palmer, we did a lot to you. We need to make you the good witch, because you went through some shit in Twin Peaks. It is, it again, like, great actress. I get, like, David Lynch has this Wizard of Oz obsession that he's inserted throughout the movie. Like, there's a yeah. lot of Wizard of Oz stuff that we just didn't mm-hmm. mention that come up consistently throughout the movie so it doesn't come out of nowhere but it's like this is falls straight into full-on surrealist like like free association that's just a little too like kind of out there for me it's it's cool it's neat i kind of like it but it's like that's how do you explain this to somebody nick cage is talking to the good witch about like how he should go back and be a father because that's what the good witch does. She gives you good advice. And I think, you know, he kind of needed like a sign. Something where it's, you know, my fear is talking. I need some big sign to show me that I can do this or that things will be okay. And then, you know, him getting knocked out by the gang members. I think that was just his brain being like, oh, you know what? That's fine. Yeah. You know, I, I could take an ass beating. I could take this. I could take that. I could be a dad. Yeah, it's, I think it's just the thing where the whole scene for me is like, this seems so out of character for Sailor. Yeah. Because it should have been like, oh, you got a son? Well, I guess, honey, time for me to be a father. And like, because it, it, they've been nothing but devoted and madly in mm-hmm. love with each other the entire movie. And then it, all of a sudden he's like, I can't do this, God damn it, I'm done. And he no, leaves. It's just, it's just showing his humanity. It's just, you know, we've seen Sailor be tough, you know, 
loving Peanut, but it's just this is just kind of like this is brand new and it scares me. It's like, you know, yeah, I, I could take on a gang of guys and I could take on hit men and I could take on your crazy ass mother. But being a parent and trying to keep, you know, both of these people safe and alive, that's probably terrifying. I I mean, that's the thing that Lynch approached in Eraserhead mm-hmm. where I, 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 I think a lot of people assume that movie's really about like fatherhood and being like scared of mm-hmm. being a father and... You know, that even comes up in stuff like um, Blue Velvet and mm-hmm. Mulholland Drive. It's like, you know, there's like fear of that. Yeah. So I I guess I can see this is Lynch still trying to work that out. You know, fear of being committed. He, you still want to be like a wild, like at heart youth or but, whatever. I mean, you know, I, I don't think it's, you know, a fear of commitment. I think it's just a fear of I'm going to screw up again and I'm probably going to be in prison for another, you know, five years, 10 years, Mm -hmm. you know, it's already done its damage on Lula, but because she loves him so much, it's okay. They make a point, you know, the first time he goes to jail and he goes, you know, it's all right. She's forgiven you. And I think that's what the good witch tells him. You know, she loves you so much. She's forgiven you for the things that you've done. Hmm. And I think that's just what it is. It's just, it's the human part of him where it's like, I could take on the world, but now that I have this child, it's a little terrifying because even when she says, you know, she tells him that she's pregnant, he's completely okay with it. She's waiting for him to flip or to, you know, dart out of there. And he's like, no, he's like, you know, I- I'm happy. I'm good with it. She's the one where she's like, I don't know if I'm happy about this. Yeah. And I think it's an, it's an, I think that's my only issue with the scene in general. I mean, like, you know, oh yeah, the good witch thing. I'm I'm basically just like playing it up for like, you know, entertainment value. Mm. But like that's my real issue with the scene is that it feels out of place for his character. Cause up to this point, he's been like, you know, down with the program. Or are we just seeing that the characters have evolved? Because, you know, mm. in the beginning, he killed a, a hitman and we've seen like, oh shit, you know, he's a badass. He's he's fearless. And now we've seen Lula where she's standing up to her mom and she's like, you know what, crazy ass mom? You are not going to get in the way between me and the love of my life and my child's father. I'm done. And now we're seeing Sailor come in and he's afraid to step into that role of being a father that might not be there every day because what if he screws up again? Mm. And Lula has evolved from being, you know, the girl screaming at danger. And now she's like, I, I've grown up. I'm, I'm, I'm in a, charge. an I, adult now. I, I can handle it. And now you're kind of bringing me your background on this movie. I guess it is a thing where it's like looking at it from these two characters' perspectives, they do have a pretty steep evolution. Mm-hmm. Maybe not like an arc of, oh, you know, oh, they were one thing and now they're another. It's like, no, they've just grown up. Yeah. Like the whole movie is this youth in revolt and, you know, these two young people just being, you know, wild and crazy. They're mm-hmm. just full of love and they're just going to see the world and let the dice fall where they may. And now they've like, grown up they're now like oh well we have a kid now like we we have to be like we can't be wild anymore we have to be adults you know we'll still be wild at heart but you know we we got we got we're there now like we've mm-hmm. we've moved past our youth i mean mm-hmm. if you put it in context like i think lula's character is 20 during the movie she's 20 when he gets out of jail for the first time yeah and then she's got and then you know six years so she's like 26 now yeah so it's like oh you had your wild 20s now you're Mm -hmm. at the point where it's like oh i guess i'm you know gonna be a mom and you know Mm -hmm. do mom stuff i guess whatever a mom stuff does in david lynch movies they don't show it but you know she's basically a single mom so she's got to do both of their jobs to to raise this little boy yeah so i hmm, i guess there there is a point to the movie in that in that sense i guess yeah i guess david lynch does come back around on this one yeah because i mean you know a sailor wakes up from being you know beaten up and the, the gang members are still standing over him and he apologizes for a, a yeah. remark that he makes we're not gonna say it calling them names I'm calling them names and then he runs down the street you know screaming for lula and of course you know there's um a traffic jam. There's a traffic jam, which means he can, you know, car surf and get to Lula. And the two of them are making out on the hood of the car. And you got the little boy who's, you know, smiling at Lula 
because he approves. And it's like, they can still be wild at heart. Just, you know, we're not going to go wild like they were in their their youth. But the movie ends with Sailor singing his favorite love song, the song he would only sing to his future wife. It, is it his favorite or is it Lula's? It, it, it seems... It's his favorite. Okay. And he starts singing, Love me tender, love me sweet. And I'm saying... Nick Cage sings the entire song over the credits. Like, it's the entire song. Well, it's not a long song. I know, Mm -hmm. but it's like, he's just, because the the camera doesn't cut, it just sort of goes around them as he sings the entire song on the hood of this car. Yeah. And it's fucking great. It's like super, I can't, I watched the entire credits. It's super fun. The only thing that was bad was the prosthetic nose. Yeah, because he- Or the Play-Doh nose. he, He had a pretty bad nose. Yeah. But in that, and that's and that's the movie. It's them being like, you know, now they're going to be together, happy ever after, love and tenderness, and all this other stuff. We're still wild at heart. Our love is wild, but you know, we're we're we've grown up now. We we could tame it to be a family. But yeah, that is wild at heart. Um, this movie, I, I mentioned it at the beginning. This won the Palme d'Or at Cannes, mm-hmm. uh, nineteen ninety. Um, the cut for the movie was finalized the day before it premiered because the test screenings for this were fucking awful. Oh, yeah. Tons and tons of people were leaving them by the day. Yeah, because it had a shit ton more violence. It was way more sexually explicit. Like, this movie had a lot of cuts to it. Mm-hmm. But when it finally got to cons, won the Palme d'Or, and some people were mad about it mm-hmm. um so people cheered when you know david lynch went up to accept his palm door people were like ah oh, finally you know a great auteur is getting his you know recognition you know because they were like oh twin peaks great yeah and then there were a shit ton of booze led by your favorite film critic roger ebert not surprised because roger ebert fucking hated david lynch movies yeah but this movie i think then and even now is pretty divisive for Lynch fans. Some people love it. Some people really hate it. It's a hard movie to have a lukewarm response to. Yeah. So I'm wondering after, you know, the conversation, you know, we found some themes, we found some depth, you know, the characters are fun. The actors are good. Where are you coming in on this? Are you with Ebert? Would you boo this at cons or no. would you cheer for Lynch's win? I cheer for Lynch's win. Um, Mostly because it's got Nick Cage. Y- you got a stronghold on me if it's got Nick Cage in it. Um, but yeah, after talking about it, I'm leaning more towards it's aight. It's aight. It's aight. You, not your favorite Lynch movie of the month? Not your least favorite? No. No, no. I mean, we can, you know, we can do that. What What's the favorite? What's the least favorite? Because it, it's very, you know. Concrete for you. Very concrete for me. Uh, I mean, I yeah, I guess we could. Uh, I, I can't remember because we we do these so out of order. We've seen all the movies so far, but yeah. what is it? Mulholland Drive is releasing after this. Hey, it's your schedule, your month. Eh, we'll just do it now. So yeah, what was your favorite of the month? What's your least favorite? Oh, definitely favorite of the month was The Elephant Man. Hit I, me in the feels. I, I agree. It's my favorite Lynch movie. And least favorite had to be Blue Velvet. I am surprised. I mean, I love the song. Some of the sequences were pretty. Like the fire truck and, you know, that very dreamy kind of, you know, Americana scene that we had. But yeah, it was just a rough watch. I am so surprised because I, I really think you you would you would have dug Blue Velvet a lot more. Mm, no. I understand. I'm, I'm in agreement with Elephant Man because mm-hmm. it's my favorite. I would probably put this as my least favorite of the month, honestly. Um, not for... Not for it being like a lesser film, just not being nearly as um I would I would prefer to watch Mulholland Drive or Blue Velvet over this. Mm-hmm. Um, but this isn't bad. I don't think this is a bad movie. It's definitely in the mid tier of the Lynch canon. Mm-hmm. I would I would call this eh, it's it's a pretty like okay movie. It's solid. Like I think you could vibe with this, but I don't know if I can recommend this to anybody. Is uh- this a hard recommend? A little bit, but, you know, David Lynch is your director. So it's kind of, you know, for me, it's like the the best way that I could recommend would be if you're doing the catalog, you obviously have to watch it. Obviously. I'm, But I'm wondering beyond that, maybe like somebody younger 
Because this seems like a movie about like youth rebellion, you know, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll kind of thing. I don't mean like younger, like 15, but like, oh, you're 19 and feeling kind of edgy. This might hit you there. Maybe. I mean, yeah. I mean, if you want to go at it like in an artsy way, sure. Mm. But I don't know. For me, it's just if you're doing the catalog, this is when you want to watch. If you're doing, you know, a whole Nick Cage catalog, obviously you got to watch this. Would you call this like one of his better movies or better performances, I sh- I should say? Because this definitely feels like he has a lot of control over it. Yeah, and I think this was the beginning of him, you know, I want to do the movies my way. Mm-hmm. I want to, you know, go wild if I need to go wild. And yeah, I, I think this is a good jumping off point. Yeah, yeah, this is probably a good a good way to put it. Because this is pretty much like, what is it, 1990? This is right before he kind of blows up into like leading man mm-hmm. a-lister status this is before laura dern gets like granted she was already acting with david lynch before in like blue velvet and other mm-hmm. films but she does jurassic park and gets that huge pay oh, yeah. bump and like star power like two three years later so this is kind of like that sweet spot of like indie darling nicholas cage <laughs> laura dern before they like blow up into mainstream yeah but you know i i think at the end of the day I could say this is a good, this is a pretty good movie. This is, I would, I would say this isn't bad if, if that's strong enough. This yeah. is not a bad movie. No, it's not a bad movie. But um, a little confusing at times, but yeah, not bad. But uh, any final thoughts on Wild at Heart? Nick Cage and Laura Dern make a good couple. Pretty strong. They're like my favorite thing about this movie. Yeah, it's like it. It doesn't feel like oh, you could tell that they're acting. It's like no, they got good chemistry with each other. I really wish they did. They had more like roles together. I I guess there is technically one more David Lynch directed thing they did together, uh, but it was a phone call mm-hmm. thing. Uh, cause what is it? I think David Lynch did a thing called the Symphony of Noise or something like that, where it's this like musical composition, mm-hmm. and it cuts as an intermission somewhere in the twenty minute mark, thirty minute mark of the mm-hmm. thing, where it's just a five minute breakup call between nick cage and laura dern Mm -hmm. where like they're kind of doing their voices from wild at heart but they're not the same characters but that's like the next time they work together Hmm. and that was like a couple years ago but you never know what the future holds never know but yeah i would say uh yeah well that's wild at heart everybody and uh next week what are we watching i know i kind of already spoiled it yeah, so since you spoiled it, I think you should tell everybody what we're doing next week. Yeah, next week to end the month is going to be Maholland Drive. That's right, Maholland Drive, the movie that everyone's considered like one of the greatest movies ever made, probably Lynch's best movie for most people. Uh, we actually have a guest on that episode. We do. Yep, that's going to be my buddy Thomas. He's a hardcore Lynchaholic, fucking loves the man, and we actually have a really good conversation for Maholland Drive. Yeah, so if you want to listen to that episode, you can follow us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. You can go to our YouTube channel, The Film Vault. That is The Film Vault on YouTube. You can go there, like, comment, and subscribe and watch the slideshow versions of this podcast. Eventually, I'll get around to uploading more of them, but until I do, you can check us out on our Instagram? Yeah, on Instagram, we're The Film Club Podcast, where we post daily stories, upcoming episodes, and random adventures we go on. And with that, we'll see you next week at the phone club. Have a good week, everybody. <laughs>